Benchong you uh this uh forum to so the minute uh and one of the Adam Liano V Marsh sweeper air air football team. <laughs> so thank you very much for, for the opportunity and I'm very happy to join you here today. Uh usually I don't know myself what I'm going to say. <laughs> so so it would be difficult for, for you to know. But generally what I what I end up doing at conferences like this is being like the sweeper on the football team. And mostly it's because I don't actually like, uh, believe it or not, making speeches. And I'm not in the entertainment game. So it doesn't matter what it was I was going to say, I've learned that over the years, what I was going to say before I got here, it changes in my head anyway as a result of listening to everybody else, because what I really want to do is join in everybody else's discussion and take the ideas forward. And it's interesting, just in, in following from what I've heard today, how in reality it doesn't matter which part of the battlefield, for want of a better word, we are on, which area of the struggle we are actually contributing to when we all get into the same room, it is so clearly the same struggle and everything that we're doing is overlapping into everything that everybody else in the room is doing, that you would wonder that long before now, we hadn't got our act together about coordinating all that more effectively uh, so that we could get better results. So you can see from that, that despite my public reputation, what I'm really interested in and what I know I'm best at is organising. Uh, I can't help my in other people's business and I can't help when people are doing things saying, do you know what, how about turning it that way? What if we looked at it this way? So when I was thinking of what I'd talk about today, the thing that came into my mind was I'm tired, not tired of struggle. <coughs> I am tired of commemorating the past. That's because it's 50 years since the civil rights and everybody wants to have a nostalgic look at the past. Everybody wants to look back at what somebody else was doing. And we need to draw inspiration from the past. We need to draw inspiration from what Father O'Donnell was doing to do what we need to do today. <coughs> That is the best way we can commemorate the people who, who gave us leadership, who inspired us, uh, and who, who gave us the momentum and courage to play our role when it came our turn. So I don't want to talk too much about the past. I actually want to talk about the present and the future. So very briefly to, to say, who am I? People tell you who I am and all them things that I did. I hit a home secretary, do I regret it? Absolutely no, I didn't hit him hard enough. <laughs> and I should have hit the whole front bench <laughs> when I was at it. Uh, people often ask me, given the, the, the long, long struggle, uh, the fact that it became militarized in the way that it did mostly at the behest the British government who militarised it, uh, given the enormous price paid and the lives lost, do I regret it? Absolutely not. Would I have done it differently? Absolutely not. Uh, did I make mistakes? We all do, but I, do I regret? Do I regret it? Mm, absolutely not. And have I any apologies? They're, they're in vogue now. Do I have any apologies to make to anybody for it? No. So I need to get that bit out of the way first. Uh, an, uh, an old friend, a uh, woman who lost two sons, most of, her, most of her family life disrupted, said to me in 1991, doesn't matter where it went wrong, doesn't matter that we got so little out of it, what mattered was it had to be done at the time. And it was noble, and it was brave, and it was just. 
that we struggled for a better place. And we will pay the penalty for it for three generations. And she, and she was right. So in 1991, when uh, effectively those who had led us to war were in those in negotiation with the British government, quite a number of, of people like myself, uh, because we were <coughs> socialists, feminists, and Democrats, did not believe that the only people who should be at the table were those who were powerful in war uh, and, and, and those who were uh, in, in positions of democratic representation, that is to say the politicians. And, and we had campaigned at that time for the inclusion, and people forget that in the peace talks, the only strand of political ideology that was consciously excluded were the socialists, were the left, consciously excluded. Uh, when we first of all put the women's voice together, uh, the women were advised to join, uh, to form a women's political party in order to get into the talks. And I think that was a mistake because it, it, it took away then from the ability to, to work across the women who were in different political parties. Uh, the left were not allowed to form a, a coalition of political parties. They specifically, that offer was not that offer was specifically not open to the small organisations on the left, to the to the Labour Party, uh, and, and the various left wing progressive movements that were there. So a number of individuals, which included myself and my lo own local area, then said, "What are we going to do to ensure that the diverse voices that do not describe themselves as unionist?" or nationalist, as social democrat or provisional, as armed or unarmed, but to find themselves in different ways. Rural people, single mums, people with disability, people whose mental health has been affected by this struggle. Where do those groupings of people get a voice in the peace? And how do we ensure that we're not left out of the peace in the same way they were invisible in the war? And, and out of that, I became involved in a small network in the, in the rural area in which I live, which was South Tyrone. And, and we, we formed just a, a discussion group, a forum, which then became a network of fascinatingly diverse groups. And in doing that, uh, Without, uh, and I think the point I want to make is that sometimes when you start to do one thing, a problem that looks insoluble solves itself. Sometimes to get the answer of a problem is to look creatively somewhere else. You know, stop obsessing about that one. So when we began to look at how do all the people who, who will be left out, will be left out of the peace, and I don't mean left out of the high-blown talks of the peace, I mean, left out of the infrastructure of the peace when it comes. So when we put it together like that, who, who, who are our people? We all agreed on a basic definition. Our community are those people who are within the area of South Tyrone. We don't, at this point, care who they are, how they got here, what they think, what they believe. But fundamentally, our network is for everybody who is here. And the things that we're interested in is the people who are furthest from the table. The table was big then. Great talks about the table, the peace table. So very simply, our interest was in ensuring the people furthest from the table, that their interests were not left out. In, in the making of the peace. And ironically, that took us, because we were trying to look, say, how did that ever happen? Did anybody ever do that before? And uh, the task usually failed me to do the research, because I, at least I, 
I may have been a failed university student having been thrown out on the neck, but at least I had been there. Uh, so I used to get the anything that looked like research burned it would do that. She went to the university. So uh, I came across one document that actually looked like we were, it meant what we were trying to do, and then had to translate it into local, local interest. And the document that I found was Boutrous Boutrous Galley's Agenda for Peace. About how if you really want peace, you have to build it simultaneously at every level of society. So since we had no power to build it here, we were all left out of here, we looked at how did you build it at every level of South Tyrone, which to us just was every level from the neighbourhood, every level from the neighbourhood to the council. And we embarked upon the wonderful works of a wheelbarrow to try and do that. And out of that grown, grew the South Tyrone Empowerment Programme, better known as STEP. Uh, and I've been working in STEP since. Worked in it as a volunteer. And then when 98 came around, uh, and essentially the economic blackout, which people used to pretend didn't exist, was lifted. And people like myself were actually allowed to earn wages without anybody like the police, you know, like, like people who pay funds, uh, intimidating those who employed us uh, from, from, being, from, from being employed. And so any of us who would get work wouldn't be in it very long till the areas we worked, the places that we worked would be raided by the police, the police would be, people would become frightened and our offers of employment would be withdrawn. <coughs> now, I've been a member of the trade union all my life, but I do have to say that throughout that period, our trade union movements did not defend us. I need to put that on the table. Our trade unions did not defend us. We had to, we, we, we didn't get work, we were blacklisted. So when that was lifted, uh, the opportunity to be employed came up. So I became a wage earner. I was a student and then I was a member of parliament. Uh, everybody's got a disreputable part of their life. <laughs> but, uh, uh, then I was unemployed, uh, economically inactive was the word, and I reared my children. Uh, as an economically inactive <coughs> person. And I joined the labor force at the age of 55, known in the trade as a woman returner. I love all, these, all the bureaucratic language. So I've been a wage earner since, and I hope uh, actually over the age of 70, I'm in my, my 71st year. <coughs> and it looks like uh, I'll, I'll keep on working till I'm 75, if only to make the pension. <laughs> but I enjoy my work, I still work in step. Uh, and the bearing on that and what Padre O'Donnell did and what he believed in and, and, and what I see happening here is to understand what step is. Step is a small community owned organization and its fundamental basis is rights. It is it, it's quite interesting to find a small communal organization in a rural area that is fundamentally based on the agenda for peace of the United Nations and translating that down into what academics would call a practice area uh, in order to study it. That's not why we do it. We do it because we live there and as it says in the song, to try and ease the pain, make life make life work for those of us who live in that area. So the South Tyrone Empowerment Programme is a rights-based programme. And we, we have a very simple philosophy in terms of the organisation. People have rights. People have human rights, guaranteed by the United Nations. And those rights should not be diminished by because they are gale goers or because they are island dwellers, or because they are rural dwellers, or because they have an intellectual 
disability or a physical disability or because you have mental health issues or because people don't like them or because you weren't born here. Those things should not actually impact on people's access to the enjoyment of, of the full enjoyment of their rights, equal to those members of society and those citizens who enjoy them at the highest standard. And so our objective was, if we were going to build a new society in Northern Ireland, this uh, was the context, if we were going to do that, if we want to build a peaceful society, a fair society, and a just society, then it couldn't just be about balancing power between nationalists and unionists, which it never was for those of us who are civil rights and human rights activists. Our goal was going to be to ensure that when they were building this new infrastructure, everybody would have the same rights. So if everybody was furthest from the table, would come to the front, and that's what we started to do. So when we started to do it, uh, at this time you have to remember, European money, peace money, was falling down upon our heads like manna from heaven. You couldn't get up in the morning without being accosted. You couldn't cross the street. You couldn't go to the pub for a drink without being accosted by somebody offering you a farm to fill in. <laughs> that would bring you large amounts of peace money signed here in the word your oyster. And we were one of the few organizations who said no thank you. That looks like us, to us like, go to jail directly, do not pass <laughs> go, do not collect 200 pounds. We didn't take any European money for a whole year. And what we did was we just widened the conversation through every village, from the neighborhoods to the villages, and we spent a year getting, not telling people what this small group of us, which was about 15 of us, who'd been working all through, all through the struggle to hold communities together, not telling people what we thought they needed, but asking them, now that the violence has subsided, now that the militarism is over, now that the army is retreating, what do you think you need? A, to survive, B, to recover, and C, to build the future. And people just, pe people are full of ideas that the rest of us would stop talking. <laughs> Absolutely full of ideas. If everybody who knows, thinks they know what the people need, would stop talking and ask them. Now, that doesn't say that everybody's idea is, is doable tomorrow, but everybody's got ideas. Some of them absolutely brilliant, some of them crazy, but some of the craziest ones turn out to be the best ones. So we had this whole plethora of ideas and we sat down, and, and if you think when you're doing this, people are learning skills, you're saying, I don't know how to do that. And somebody else who does knows how to do it. Uh, I saw a thing on, on, on uh, I was in Edinburgh, I'm only back from Edinburgh from a social, World Social Enterprise Conference. And they were showing a project in Ethiopia. And uh, this nine-year-old was speaking, this nine-year-old girl was speaking, and he said, and, and what's your role? She said, I'm the accountant. <laughs> Brilliant. I, <laughs> not I'm a little girl, when I grew up, I might be an accountant. I am the accountant <laughs> in this project. And, and so people, people are learning skills on the job and finally we put together the South Tyrone Empowerment Programme for the whole area. And then we went to the European Union and we hit them for 350,000 pounds. <laughs> and they got onto the table and they said, oh, would you settle for 52? So we had a big conversation about that and we took the 52. <laughs> on the basis, very scientific, principled, socialist basis, that was better than a poke in the eye with a sharp stick. <laughs> so we took the 52, and we said, right, now, because of the way we had done this, this was a cross community as a phrase in Northern Ireland. Catholics, Protestants, dissenters, uh, 
atheists. There were at this point no Baha'is, Muslims or Hindus, but we were all in there. Uh, and the idea, I mean, one of us said it's better than a poke in the eye with a sharp stick. But uh, one, one of our members who was a former member of the Ulster Defence Regiment, uh, was a member of the Elam Pentecostal Church, he produced, which I had totally forgotten about, uh, there's something in the Bible about the talents, you know, about the man and the talent, and he turned them into ten. So David decided that with, with uh, the first 52,000 pounds, if we could get ten more, you know, if we could nine more talents, we'd end up with more money than we'd asked for. So that's what we did. With 52,000, we then started to say, if we had, with this 52,000, could you give us 52,000 more to do this and work with women? And then we said, oh, with this 104,000, <laughs> could you give us another 52,000 to work with people with disabilities? And we kept going round the circle till we literally ended up with 520,000 pounds <laughs> for a three year program. And we thought, wow, we didn't know daylight robbery was as easy. <laughs> and you didn't go to jail. Yeah. And, 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 and the important thing about that was, was, and we've learned that lesson, and we've maintained that lesson, money is the last thing communities need. When, you, when you're looking at something, say, how do, we, how do we sustain life on this island? How do we sustain this community? How do we move forward with this idea? Money is the last thing people need. Now that's not to say that people don't need money. Of course they do. But if the conversation starts with money, you're corrupted already. You're bought off already, and you're beat already. Because if the conversation starts with money, you're already trading. What will you give up in order to get the money? How far will you move back from what you want in order to get the money in to do a bit of what you do? Whereas if you start off as a community knowing what you want and knowing what you need, no matter how crazy it looks to everybody else, you're in the right starting point. And you look and say, how can we put that together? Well, could we do that? No, not here, put it on that, put it on the long term. And some of them went, put that with the next generation. Uh, then you come to the point, what's doable now? What's doable later? And what's out there? Then you can start to say, what have, what have we got now? And, and where's the gap? And where we get the money to fill the gap? And then we used to have conversations, because bear in mind we're coming out of conflict, we used to have conversations that are same the world over. Where do you get money? Same as everybody else gets it. You either print it, if you're the government, that's all right. If you're not the government, you go to jail for that, because that would die, we all been there. You could steal it, no, penalties are too high. You could earn it, that's a possibility. You can beg it, or you can borrow it. Begging it, borrowing it, and earning it are the only ways you can do without going to jail. So we did all we did all three of that. And we start we started off essentially by by borrowing it. And and when I say borrow, I don't mean we went to the banks. Grant from the European Union we looked on as borrowing. And the first thing we did in everything when we were talking about that money was ensure that everybody who was involved in the upskilling, in the training, and, and we worked in fact on, with, with, with you and the trade union movement on that, everybody who has been trained, everybody who was learning new skills, we were running creches and childcare so that people could go, everybody knew where that money came from. And everybody had to understand that that was working people's money. And so we now had an opportunity to politically educate people. This isn't money from on high. This money started on the ground. It belonged to people like you and me who paid their taxes, who paid, in, paid into the public purse in Europe, and it goes up there and it comes back down here. So wasting this money, entertaining the masses and throwing this money away, is actually doing a disservice to your neighbour. 
It's a political act of theft to take public money and not use it properly. So we had a, a so we're building a, a political, not in political parties, but we're building a politically active community. And we weren't too long at that, from 98 to 2001, till the greatest opportunity coming from the peace was inward migration. And so we had people coming from Portugal, from Africa via Portugal, which is a long story about colonization. Uh, then in 2004, mainly from, from the rest of the European Union. And all coming into South Tyrone, a rural economy, because of the agri-food. It was quite interesting that inward migration came to us through the agri-food. And our model, because people love to call these things models, our idea seemed to work because our core was right. Who are our people? Our people are whoever is within this district boundary at this time. No matter how they got here. Now when we wrote that phrase, we were actually thinking of the planters who came 400 years ago. Because uh, that was the big issue, you know, they, uh, they stole our, and they, and they did, you know. Yeah, there's no doubt about that, you know, the, the, the big landlords and, and the planters and, and, and the gills came and stole our fields. There are people in Tyrone still know the name of exactly the person they stole them from and, and, and want them back. But that, that stood good for people coming in last week from, from, foreign, from foreign parts. And so they, the model meant that they had to be included as well, they had equal <coughs> rights, uh, and, and we had to overcome. We had to overcome. People who say, Bernard, you used to be on our side, and now you're on the side of the foreigners. I say, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm always on the same side. You have shifted ground. You used to believe in rights, and now we realize it was only your own rights you were interested in. So we had those conversations. We learned a lot of things, and, and I think I want to move on then from what, what we're doing to where it has taken us, and where it has taken me. I think there are places we have to look at, looking at the legacy of, of, of O'Donnell, and looking at the legacy of the people who, who come to the building of a radical progressive idea about building a society fit for human beings to live in. And you think that should be a no-brainer, but it's absolutely a radical, subversive idea that society should be a place where all human beings should be able to live uh, and, and enjoy life and have the same rights as everybody else. And where does that take us in the 21st century? One of the things that's fascinating me now, and that's why I said that social enterprise network conference in Edinburgh. Linking in with, with our last speaker, we do a lot of work through this and then uh, development trust that I'm involved in and the social enterprise network that I'm now involved in. We do a lot of work with the Highlands and Islands of Scotland. Because in my perverse mentality, the rural area is like an island, is like the islands except that the distances between the villages isn't water. You know, if, if all of we rural scattered villages around Ireland were separated from each other by water, then we would see them as, as islands and isolated. But sometimes it's as hard to get from a rural village in the top of the Sperrans to a main town as it would be to get from this island uh, uh, in, into the mainland. So the real question is, is to, to my mind was, how can we live where we want? How can we, you know, I, I'm a rural person. I, I, I love this city. I can't live in it for longer than three weeks at a time. It's a suffocating place. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting for a while. But I spent a while in jail, as some of you may know. And the only parallel I know to living in jail is living in the city. Because you get up every morning and you can't see, you can't actually see the sky. You can only see the brick wall, the stone wall, the building nearest to you. And, and 
and is suffocating and is claustrophobic. <coughs> and I think if you live in cities all your life, if you're overcrowded and live in those funny places all your life, that over a period of time your brain will shrink to meet the context of the place you live in. And so you can't, if you can't see the horizon, you can't think to the horizon. Uh, that's my prejudice. So therefore, all the best thinkers must be rural, must, must be rural people, <laughs> must be rural people. Because, they, because every day, they can see how big the world is. They can see to the horizon. There are no doubt that the world is round. There are no doubt of, of how, how they fit in to, uh, you know, the, they know their place on the planet instinctively because they're rural people. Island people have a double benefit. They're rural people by nature of islands, and they're also island people, so they can see the sea, which rural people can't do, because sometimes we, our view is blocked by the mountains. <laughs> so I think one that rural people, you know, we owe it to our city dwellers to stop apologizing for our existence. We need to start changing this conversation and recognizing that it is totally unnatural to live in large urban conurbations built of concrete, devoid of the natural environment that allows us to live and breathe and grow and be emotionally connected to our place and through that to be mentally well. So the one thing that I said we have to start doing is start changing the conversation. Now once we change the conversation, we get the buts. You know, we change the conversation and say, no, the way we live is, is correct. The way we live is correct. And more people in the city should come and try it. That's where the buts come in. But it's too far from the city, but the transport doesn't work, but the schools. And then we have a conversa a real conversation. There is absolutely no evidence to support the idea that small schools are bad for children. None. Overcrowded schools are bad for children. Overcrowded classrooms are bad for children. Schools with lack of resources are bad for children, but small schools are not. Children from P1, P2, P3 taught in the same class, not bad for children. They become peer educators. All the research shows it's good for children. It's the, it's the way we use the resources that turns that on its head. People say, well, <coughs> uh, it's very difficult it's not if you change the idea of what a school should be. A school is the heart of a community. So the school should be the place where children go to school. It should be the place where the chemist shop is. It should be the place where the creches, where the old people's activities are. A school should not be a place, you know. So if we, if we look at these things, then we can change conversations. I'm also fascinated about looking at the role of the collective economy. We have the public sector here and we have the private sector here. And the state has hived off most of the public duty to the private sector. And because we are a rights-based organization, we hold on to a piece of string. And we say to people, if you have the right, just you catch that piece of string and hold on to it tight, that is your right. And bit by bit together, we move like this till we find where the barrier is to your getting it. And bit by bit we'll find who has a statutory legal responsibility for ensuring you get your right. And bit by bit, as we go along, we'll find who else doesn't have your right so that they can join us. So that every individual problem becomes a collective crusade about getting to the end of it. And you say, what will we do with the string when we get there and pull it? We will hold people to account. 
We wrap the string around their necks, <laughs> around their feet, around their wrists, but they will be held to account. <coughs> and a number of victories we've had there. We've had a small rural school, which the government, you might have heard of and you might not, Clinty Clay School. It's 150 years old, and the government tried <coughs> to close it on the basis that all those things, too small, you'd have to move to the next school, but we knew if you agree to that, the next school will also be too small in a year or two, and we start the domino effect. So we said, we fought them, we fought them at every level. We got the community organized, we fought them to the high court, uh, and, and you put your basic walk away point in. Every parent in the school said before they would close the school, they would take the school over and run it as a community enterprise. <coughs> they take the whole school out of the education system. And they said, you won't be able to pay for it. And they said, oh yes, we will. Out of the compensation we get from the government for failing to provide an adequate education for our children, <laughs> we'll be able to pay for it. But by organizing, by agitating, by educating, and no one, no one, were you not, not to take your eye off the prize. We finally beat the government, and do you know what? It, we know why we won. Well, the judge set out a whole lot of reasons. It was too much trouble to keep fighting us. They said, oh, for God's sake, give them the school for now. So we'll have, a, we'll have another battle. So we're looking at those very small ways and that's how I think all of it has to begin. It has to begin on the ground. But that vision on the ground for today's collective solution has to be linked in to the other things that have been talked about. You can't do your small bit to the detriment of your neighbor doing their small bit, or you become like this. These two things have to work together. So that whatever you're doing, it's not done at the cost of harm to somebody else. And whatever you're doing has to be done within the context of everybody having the same rights at the end of the day. It has to be done with learning that government is a servant of people. Society invented government, not the other way around. And society can end government, not the other way around. And then you have to remember something my father who died when I was nine taught me before he died. As one of five girls and, and a boy, the boy was only an infant of, of less than two when he died. But the girls were like steps of stairs. My father was a carpenter who was interested in gardening. He worked most of his time in England. But he was interested in gardening. And he was planting stuff in the garden one day and all the children around helping him to plant. And he took an old fashioned threepenny bit out of his out of his hat pocket and he planted it and he covered it. we were laughing at him he planted it and he covered it up and he stuck a wee marker in it and he wrote the same he would go to the plants 3d <laughs> and he left it there and as all the plants were growing we'd forgotten about it he went back you see and he dug it up again dust it and he showed it to us and, and we didn't know what the lesson was till he told us. He showed us all the other plants and said they've grown. And this one hasn't, he said. Money only grows in the back of working people. Money only grows into more money if it's planted in the labor of working people. And I never, ever forgot that. So when I'm talking to people about European Union money or government grants or going to beg it, I haven't suggested stealing it yet, <laughs> that all of this money doesn't belong to them, doesn't belong to the bank. All of this money is money that ordinary people like you and me and our children and our grandchildren created. And while we talk about democracy and democracy of the workplace, and adding to a, a wider participative democracy of society, we have also got to democratize wealth. We have got to begin 
to democratise wealth. And the very simple basis of that is countries with good services and good opportunities for people, countries with good childcare, countries with good education, are high tax economies, high tax, high service. The public purse has no money if we don't put it in as a society. So people who want good services have to have a government that is brave enough to take money off its wealthy for the good of everybody else. In this modern society of the 21st century in which we live, the capacity of the citizens is significantly greater than it was 100, 200 years ago. By and large, the capacities, certainly in Western democracies and wealthy nations, the majority of citizens have an intellectual, a physical and educational capacity that was the realm of a very few people 200 years ago. And therefore, methodologies of representation and collective economies of ages ago don't belong in the 21st century. But old collective ideas belong in the future. We can, as citizens, through cooperatives, through not-for-profit businesses, through community-owned assets that need to be locked in so they're not sold off cheap to the private sector, we can support government in the delivery of services and opportunities. We can look after ourselves collectively by revitalizing the cooperative movements by looking at the vast amount of monies in the credit union that could be not just sitting there, but re actually reinvested in communities. And looking at, instead of public-private partnerships with the government and private for-profit, you know, the key, the key is actually in the word. Private companies exist to make profit. That doesn't make them bad people, but that's why private companies exist that the partnerships should be partnerships between government and communities to effectively deliver meaningful local services to local people when they're, when they're needed. All of those things are possible. All of those things are doable without starting a revolution, but never take your eye off the revolution. <laughs> because at the end of the day, all of that is conducted within the context that what we call democracy is at this 21st century, what is left to us when the transnational companies have taken everything else. We don't have a democracy. We don't have a real democracy in Ireland or in Northern Ireland or in the UK or in Europe. If the big companies and the big banks can tell us the penalties for exercising our free will, which they can. So that big battle has to be fought. But we can't win that battle simply by shouting, somebody robbed us. We have got to build our capacity, build our communities, sustain our rural communities, and we can. Currently, if you don't, if you think keeping, keeping this island functioning is too crazy an idea, let me share you a really crazy idea. I am currently involved in a development trust known as the Loch Ney Development Trust. And you know where Loch Ney is. It's a big slap of water sitting in the middle of Northern Ireland biggest freshwater lake in Northern Ireland. And the, as I've said here, you know, when, when you're an island community, we have small rural communities sitting all around that lot. They are impoverished, they have all the same problems, Close, their schools are closing, post offices are gone, they don't grit our roads in the winter anymore, the bus only comes in once a week. But we're all sitting around a significant community asset that nobody's looking after, that has no cohesive management, 
that the government's not interested in, or in fact, we don't have a government at the moment. I don't care. <laughs> you would not believe the things you get away with when there's no government. <laughs> And the whole land that the water sits in, the basin of Loch Ney, is owned by the 12th Earl of Shaftesbury. Because the first Earl of Shaftesbury stole it, and the Chichesters stole it from the king. King, of course, stole it from us, but I'm not worried about that story now. <laughs> we are embarked with help and guidance from the Highlands and Islands on taking ownership of that back into a community trust that is owned by the people that live around that Loch Shore, that is owned by those communities, that will establish a coherent management, that will invest in and use and develop the potential of that loch so that we can all live where we live, maintain the ecological system, support industry, support the environment. And I have no doubt, if you watch this space, it will happen in five years. And you think you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs>